Richard, thank you so much for meeting with us today uh, and inviting us into your studio, man. It's yeah, really course. cool. Um, thanks, for, and, uh, thanks for coming over. No, it's amazing. Uh-huh. And uh, it's cool to see where you work. And, you know, I had some questions for you about your process and stuff, but sure. I can kind of like figure it out a little bit. Like I was going to ask you about. It's a mess in here. No, <laughs> it's supposed to be, right? But I li- yeah, that's kind of what I like about uh, working in a mess and trying to kind of clean it up and make something nice out of the mess, I guess. Yeah. And um, as far as your your start and all this stuff, because, well, you've got so many different elements of art that you work with. Did you start as a musician or an artist or what's your kind of uh, beginning? I started, yeah, as an artist. The graphic design is was what I went to school for. And that kind of turned into uh, more of a mixed media process to kind of get away from just the trappings of graphic design and having to do everything kind of by the book and making the logo bigger and all that boring kind of stuff. So um, around 2010, which I think we were probably, I knew you were around that time, yeah, I think, sure. yeah, uh, from Radioactive Days, uh, around that time, um, I did something where I took on the challenge of making one piece of art a day for the whole year. And that ended up being uh, collages. So I started with collages because it was a very immediate kind of process. And it was something that was graphic as well. So it was kind of a mixture between my day job, doing graphic design, and then the stuff that I was interested in from, you know, uh, studying art at school, like the Dada movement, Bauhaus, stuff like that. Um, So that's kind of where it came out of, was um, visual and then... In parallel, I'd started working on music kind of in the way, in the same way, so collaging musical elements, but not really playing anything. You have any like formal education no. with music? No. No. Um, one, actually, there was one class I, I went to FAU, and there was this one class that really opened up my mind to music, and it was called Art and Music. And uh, I discovered like minimalism, like we learned about Steve Reich and Philip Glass and stuff like that, and this kind of idea of mixing the two worlds together, music and art, and the final project in that class was to make a musical composition as an artist, as somebody who's not a musician, a uh, trained musician, and that was kind of like the first um, performance I ever did uh, was in that class at school, so, yeah. That was like 2010 era, or? Oh, I want to, you know what? That before was, that? No, that was before. So, I mean, I had always kind of dabbled in visual stuff. And I guess it started around, yes, sound. So sound I started doing, I want to say that was 2007. Hmm. Something like that. Yeah, 2007, because I was still in school. So, yeah, around that time. So, yeah, it's been a while. Huh. Uh-huh. And, uh, like, as far as, like, your arsenal of instruments and stuff like that, like, when did you start compiling this stuff around then or that? Yeah, around then. And that's kind of what inspired me to start making the music was finding like these uh, these cassette players, uh, their Library of Congress cassette players. And the cool thing about them is that they have variable pitch control, uh, variable pitch and speed control. So um, this was my first instrument was making these tape loops. Uh, so it's just a little strand of tape, nine inch strand of tape, um, and then you pop it in and you can mess with it, mess with the speed, run it through effects. Um, so that's kind of where I started. It was kind of this idea of, and on here, just taking either a random, a random piece of a tape and just seeing what happens. You cut your own tape? Yeah. Uh-huh. So these are all spliced by hand and then popped back into the cassette, uh, cassette shell. And is that pretty easy to get access to that kind of material still? Uh, just going to thrift stores and picking up old tapes. And you, um, what, tape over them? or? Yeah, tape over them or use what's already here. Like, um, let me play this one for you. It's kind of an interesting one. I think this came from some kind of a self-help tape or something. Or let's... We are all more interested in ourselves than in anything else in the world. We are all more interested in ourselves than in anything else in the world. And you got it to loop, or yeah. We are all more that interested in ourselves than in anything and it, else in the and world. It fit. And then there's the B side, which is the sound. I forget what that is. That I probably recorded onto the tape. To um, to get that loop, do you use just <clears throat> two tape decks or something? Or no, just I I get the tape, I gut it, 
get the shell clean and then cut out the piece that I need and just t put it back in and screw the shell back in. Right. So they're essentially like little samples. Yeah, yeah. Uh, primitive samples, you know, which that's how they were doing it back in the day with tape. And um, you, do you incorporate this into your live performances or just yes. everything? Yeah, that has um, always been the foundation, I feel. Like when you saw me with Gavin the other night, uh, that was kind of more of a stripped down. When I do a collaborative thing, I always like to kind of mix it up. So I was using this keyboard and the trumpet and something else, I forget, some something bowed the maybe? The saw, yeah. The saw. Yeah, the saw. Um, but this has always been the foundation, I feel like. It's just a layer that you don't really notice it. Um, and I think it's something that like Brian Eno said about music where it could be ambient music can be very engaging or it could be left to kind of be in the background and I feel like having the tape element is just something it's just another layer you know it's just something that's kind of uh, decorative maybe to the main thing that's going on or sometimes it might be in the forefront so um, but I always feel like the tape is kind of the foundation of what I do with music Cool, man. And well, speaking of foundation, yeah. are you still doing Night Foundation? Is that yes. a project? Yes, Night Foundation is kind of my most recent projects. So I've been through a lot of collaborative things and solo things. And I feel like Night Foundation is kind of the most current uh, expression of what I'm doing. And it's a combination of all these things. It's a combination of the more experimental stuff with the tape and then also kind of um, synthy kraut rockish new agey type of stuff uh and then post-punk so i feel um going back to i guess music um well we're still talking about music but i always felt like uh post-punk has always been kind of the umbrella over everything over these different strains of music uh that have emerged over the years so electronic music ambient music i feel it all comes from the experimentation of post-punk so uh there that I feel first and foremost is kind of um, the foundation and night foundation is post-punk is this idea of being able to mix electronics um, with guitar, you know, guitar, rock based elements, and then also jazz things like trumpet and clarinet. Uh, so that's kind of what night foundation is. And um, yeah, I feel like it's just, um, it's my most purest expression up until now musically. Does that differ from your solo? Like if you were to bill yourself under your name, is that... Yeah, uh, it's it's interesting, you know, how, uh, like, those lines are blurred sometimes. I guess if I was billed as myself, like, kind of what you saw me doing with Gavin, um, I mean, it's still kind of the same thing. We just like to put labels on stuff and frame things differently. So, essentially, what you're seeing as me in my solo name as opposed to Knight Foundation, it's going to be about the same thing. Maybe I'm a little bit more experimental with my own given name. I don't know. It's You're not it's like playing a set. Like say, you know, you've got a catalog of music that you probably tap into for Night Foundation, which yeah. you don't do for your solo? Or? Under my under my, uh, under my personal name, uh, it's more like production credit, I guess, and more kind of like art-based stuff, where Night Foundation, I leave more to just this idea of a band, mm -hmm. you know, where other people could be involved. So the last thing I did with Night Foundation, and it was one of the last releases I did on Noir Age, which was a seven inch with uh, this artist, Little Annie, who she's been around for decades. And she started in that 80s post-punk era. You know, she was playing at Max's Kansas City in the late 70s, early 80s. You know, she was um, hanging out with Suicide. She moved to the UK in the early 80s to play with Crass. Uh, you know, she squatted in a shed with Adrian Sherwood. She was in to dub music, uh, but always underground, always underground, never really compromised in a sense. So she never really m not made it or blew up, but that's not what she ever wanted to do. And she's collaborated with so many different people. So it was an honor to be able to record with her and do this record. And um, so that's kind of, yeah, that was the last release for Night Foundation, and then I have something coming up um, with the label with Noir Age to uh, commemorate the 60th release, which is going to be a release uh, with myself and a collaborator, David Bruski, and it's going to be a double cassette. And um, uh, how did you connect with Little Annie? Was that, is she, she's not local here. She's local. She's she lives local. here now. Yeah. So she lived in the UK for most of the 80s and then moved back here around the 90s, stopped doing music altogether, became a painter, 
lived in New York for all that most of that time through the 2000s and then moved here to Miami Beach um, I want to say like 10 years ago or so and we linked up after I moved back from New York through a mutual friend and um, she saw me live actually she she saw me play at the ICA uh, this like cool rooftop party and um, Drew McDowell was the headliner and she knows Drew McDowell from the 80s because he was in Coil so there was that connection and um, she liked what I did and hit me up after the show and we started talking and then she's you know she's a painter and she was like uh, you know I need help um, digitizing my paintings and making an archive of my work well, can you help me do that? I said, sure. And, and then kind of in, in turn, she was just like, and let's work on some music, you know, let's, you have any like instrumentals I could sing over, stuff like that. So that's kind of how uh, our partnership began. Very cool, very cool. And what's your um, collaboration with, uh, you said Dave Bruski? Um... Yeah, so David Bruski, uh, do you know him? No, I mean, I feel like I've heard his name, yeah, but... No, he wasn't at the gig, but um, man, and I've known him for about... One of, the, one of the like people I've known the longest down here, especially in the experimental music scene, I met him at Churchill's a long, long time ago at some weird industrial noise show. And he was, I think he had just moved here from Chicago and he was kind of looking for stuff going on. You know, he's a really deep music head. He goes uh, really deep into experimental music. And so it was cool to meet him, however, I mean, so many years ago. And uh, that was the first release on Noir Age was a split between him and myself. And it was just kind of like, um, out of necessity, we were playing a show. And we're like, we want to have like a tape to sell at the show. And he's like, I've got some blank cassettes. You know, I'll say, yeah, I'll design something. Uh, We worked on some tracks together and put them to tape. And it was like an addition of like, 15 copies or something like that and then it was like okay we need a name for the label and the war age it just kind of came out of nowhere and um yeah that's kind of where it came out of it was our collaborate our collaboration together and then uh that's going to be the most current release which is the 60th release for the label very cool and uh, so whenever you make these cassettes that they're limited do you always have like a digital accompaniment yes. to it uh yeah so there's always a digital version um just because I feel like that's just kind of an easy way for people to consume music nowadays, um, where there you have the physical thing, which I still, the physical object is is very much the focus of the label and has always been, uh, between, you know, the physical object, the artwork, the presentation, the package, um, and then there's the digital um, part attached to it, a card here. So these were... That was a pretty active year. That was actually, was that 2020 or that was 2021? Um, so those are all the tapes there. And I expanded kind of outside of the um, cassette box into these kind of bigger format things that come in a bag with hmm. a folded kind of piece of artwork. And um, you've got so many artists on your label from all over the world. Uh, how do you connect with them? And like, how do you, I guess, bring them into your... So yeah, that's that's interesting because it kind of started the idea was like to okay release music locally um, and not to say that there's only well there's only a handful of kind of local stuff that's more experimental avant-garde so it was kind of like well you know I might kind of run out of artists or I could only release so much of my own music you know that's always kind of been an idea it's like okay I could release my own music but it's like there's there's so much more out there that I feel like needs uh, attention and just needs um, just a different framing. And one of the first artists I re- reached out to was Gafael, was a guy, he's based in Wales in the UK. And I'd heard his uh, stuff on SoundCloud and really liked it and reached out and I said, hey, do you want to do a tape together? And it all kind of came together. And then that kind of opened up this idea of, well, I don't have to just limit myself to South Florida. Um, you know, I have access to people all around the world who are making music in a very specific with a very specific vision and ideology um in this kind of diy experimental ambient type music um so that just kind of led the journey you know and i've worked with artists from norway georgia um uh Germany, Mexico City, um, you know, I'm just always exploring and kind of keeping keeping my eye out and ear out. Um, and so, what's your yeah. involvement with their production? Like, do you do any of the 
you know, mixing, recording, or? For the most part, um, they do all the recording, mixing, even mastering. Um, my focus is always on the artwork. So it's, um, it's just kind of picking up this challenge of taking this, you know, here's this album from this artist from Serbia that I've just released via, e that I've just received via email, and then I listen to it, and I think, okay, what art would go with this? How should this be presented? Um, and then that's kind of where it goes. And then we collaborate in that sense where they're giving me, um, you know, a music, a piece of music to make something visual out of. So that's kind of where it comes out of. Do they give you any kind of expectation on their end? Like, oh. Sometimes there'll be a direction. Like, you know, I, won't, I might want to see, do something maybe with this photo or with this concept. And, or sometimes they're just like, we trust you, go, go crazy. <laughs> you know, uh, so those are always kind of, it could be daunting because it's just like I have free range to do wh whatever, but at the same time it's fun because it challenges you to think and kind of do something different. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, I was looking at a lot of your artwork that you've produced, mm -hmm. and I guess it's it's all you. It's really it's neat how it's so different, but at the same time there's kind of a unifying theme in a way, right? So it's this idea, you know, at first I was like, okay, you know, it's – it's a simple idea to be like, okay, I'm a collage artist. I'm going to put a collage on every album cover, but that's too easy, I feel. And um, it gets me to go back into graphic design, but away from commercial graphic design and tap into kind of what my first love in getting into visual art was, which was album covers. You know, seeing stuff like uh, Dark Side of the Moon album cover still, I feel, is like my favorite one because there's no text on there. It's just this weird shape and it's very stark and minimal. Uh, so kind of being able to have a go with that, you know, and kind of do that myself with these underground artists and, you know, create something new. Really cool. And do you have a lot of stuff coming up um, for this new year that you're working on or plans for, you know? Um, yeah, so I have uh, that release that I mentioned, which is going to be the 60th release for the label. And I've got a few releases already kind of lined up some of them i have already the music some of them i'm still waiting on it's always kind of a very um experimental process as well you know just like getting in touch with the artist or you know so, something a demo I've, I've been getting a lot of demos and a lot i've been releasing a lot of demos that are really good um so it's a mixture of me reaching out to artists that i like and artists reaching out to me who maybe I've worked with in the past who, hey, here's some new music. So I've got about um, maybe four or five or so releases lined up for the new year. Um, so it's hard now to, it's like release, to receive demos and sift through things, but I'm finally at that level, I guess, where, you know, there's an attention there, which is nice. Um, Multitasking. So, yeah, multitasking. So there's that. And then um, focusing on, yeah, live gigs that I'm doing, like one uh, that I'm really putting a lot of energy into and looking in forward to uh, is going to be part of this thing called Ignite 2024, which is here right in Dania Beach. And it's going to be a sound light performance installation. I'm working with uh, old colleague Anna Mendez, who is actually the second release for Noir Age was um, a score that I did to one of her dance pieces that I released on a tape. So we're working together again this year on a performance sound installation called The Light Pours Out of Me. And that's going to be January 24th. I saw the advertisement for that's at Mad Arts. Mad Arts, which is right down the street from here, which is a beautiful thing because I feel like um, right now Broward's kind of lacking a art community. And I feel that Dania and Mad Arts is really kind of stepping up and doing a lot to kind of fill that void, which is nice. And convenient for your location. Yeah, and you have like My Mama's, which is right over there, which is a super cool book and record shop. And um, yeah, we got a cool little thing going on down here, I think, which is I nice. Yeah. Cool. How did like your relationship with them come together so, like, for this um, piece coming up? Mad, Mad, I first started working with uh, when I moved back from New York. Um, Mark, who owns the company, he was kind of a friend of a friend of a friend, so he's kind of part of that older kind of punk scene down here, punk art scene. Um, he knew Brooke Dorsch early on, and so kind of like that that um, crowd of people, and he has an ad agency, but then he's, you know, his he's a photographer, so first and foremost, his, his vision is, you know, the visual arts and supporting that, so through 
through that, um, he kind of gave me my first studio space over here. He had uh, he had this warehouse that was here by the train tracks in um, in Fort Lauderdale, and I uh, had a studio space in there. So he's very much been always supportive of just art and underground things going on. So when he got this building recently, um, that was going to be kind of one of the main focuses was um, having his company there, but then also building out gallery space for local artists to come and work on things. That's really cool. One thing I wanted to ask you about was yeah. that um, calendar. Are you going to put that out? Um, so I've had I've had that idea and it, it kind of started um, kind of cooking last year where I was just like, OK, uh, and it kind of came out of necessity where I was just like, uh, we had gotten this calendar, we got two copies of it, it was a Bauhaus calendar, and it was like super cool, it had all this great Bauhaus artwork on it each month, and then it was like over, and I couldn't find another good calendar, so I was like, fuck, I don't want to have something up in the house, it's just like, you know, like puppies are cool, but it's like, I don't, you know, puppy calendar, whatever, so I was like, I'll just create my own calendar, so it was just kind of a thing, and it was just like, every month, it was like, all right, I gotta make the calendar now, so I'd turn over the sheet, draw the grid, and then it was always just kind of some kind of sketch that I could live with and look at every day for a month. Um, so the idea now is to make an actual printed calendar for 2025 uh, with original artwork and um, yeah, just the new year. So uh, we put out that out through the label. Or? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Right. That makes sense. I think that might be a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, you can have, I don't know, target in the release it I, it's probably yeah, too much be, work to there do. might well no yeah the, so it's just i mean it's always a work in progress but yeah there could be a musical component to it where each month you uh maybe i get an artist from the label to make a mix for that month or do a musical composition for that month or a di one day from that month or i figure out how many artists on the label when is their birthday maybe i do something with that um time Time based, something time based, which I feel is a very simplistic concept, but it's a foundation of a lot of art in his time. Cool. So, uh, so yeah, the calendar. So look out for Noir Age 2025 calendar. We're gonna keep an eye out for that. Yeah. Amazing. If there's like a demand for a cassette that's out of print, do you re-release that, or like what's the? Interesting. Yeah, that you ask that, and there's been a few um, just cassettes like that, the nice releases that I've done. One of them is with. Gafael actually from Wales who um, I've thought about doing like a reissue because sometimes you know these cassettes are run of 50 and some of them you know sell over time some of them sell out immediately it's always kind of hard to determine you know it's like I love everything that I release I wouldn't release it if I didn't you know um, so first and foremost I have to be 100% interested and in, you know feeling the release and sure I've done some releases in the past where Maybe it's been more of a personal relationship and that's why I've released something or maybe it's been more of like, okay, I like the way the visual is going or I don't know, it's always a different, it's always a different kind of package. Um, so this idea of like kind of going back and reissuing stuff maybe because there's a demand for it and not so much like, oh, I'm going to make a bunch of money off of reissuing this thing because, you know, for the most part I, I break even, you know, I'm not rolling the dough doing this doing this label so um, I'm open to that and I'm open to something that I did recently which was a tape that I did in 2020 when I was still in the in the cassette boxes and I said well I think you know I've got a few of these tapes left let me package it in the Rizzo Graph thing which is a bigger envelope kind of cassette package so I went back and did a run of 10 of this old cassette so stuff like that you know I'm always interested in really cool and I saw that um not too long ago you released vinyl for the first time are you still doing that is that like yeah i mean obviously it takes more time it's more money it's more of uh you know it's it's more of an undertaking because um yeah it's just a lot more production involved in that uh the beautiful thing about a cassette is that i could do everything for the most part on my own i mean i get the cassettes uh professionally dubbed at a place in um fort lauderdale Wilt manners uh called audio duplication um, it's been there for years. It's, you know, and they do great work. It's quick turnaround. So that's kind of, that's the production side of the cassettes. And then I work with the guy who does the Rizzo Graph printing in Miami. His name is Eric and he does great work. And, um, so those are kind of my people. It's audio duplication, the printing, and then I package everything. I fold everything. Um, 
so uh, so with the vinyl, that's I've done three vinyl releases so far. I've done one 12 inch, which was my own music of Night Foundation. Uh, <clears throat> the other two seven inches was a band called Mother Sky, which was a band that I had in New York with my pal Alex. And then the most recent thing, which is Night Foundation with Little Annie. So I guess the vinyl is more kind of um, a way for me to get my music out there because it's self-contained in that way, I guess, where, you know, I'm making a big investment spending this money. Um, so it's, I guess, maybe a little bit of a vanity thing, maybe, but, um, you know, I'm spending the money. So, um, but yeah, I plan to do another vinyl release. It hasn't materialized yet. I don't know what it's going to be, but I'd definitely like to do another vinyl release. Really cool. Mm -hmm. And how many do you run of those? Uh, so the last record I did with Little Annie, that was a run of 300. The 12 inch I did was 100 and the Mother Sky was, I think, 200. So I've been kind of climbing up 100, 200, <laughs> 300. Right. Um, obviously, the more volume you, you do, the less price of the unit is. So you could sell it for a little bit less. Um, it's business stuff, you know, I'm, I've been learning as I go along and, and coming from working at Radioactive, you know, that really uh, turned me on to kind of business principles and different things that I learned through, you know, with working with Mikey and stuff and moving vinyl in that kind of way. So uh, that inspired me to kind of do it on my own and do a label. Very cool. So from that. And do you do you sell it at any of the local stores or do you do it from your website? Yeah, so the the backbone of the label is Bandcamp, like I feel it is with a lot of independent labels. Uh, but I make it a point to um, have physical copies at Technique, at Radioactive, at Sweat Records, at my mama's, um, you know, any shops that are really open to it. I mean, you know, it's a lot of work for one person. So it's like I wish I could go out to more shops and be that promo person. But I feel where I'm at right now. Uh, kind of doing it on my own. Yeah, it could always be better. With anything, it could always be better. I could be reaching out to more blogs and giving away more promos and doing booking release parties, but um, I don't know. It's a lot, uh, and I hope to be able to organize a little bit better now in the new year. Yeah, yeah. And we talked a little bit earlier off record about YouTube and things like that, and you mentioned that you have some videos and things. What kind of videos do you have up? Is it like full-length like accompanying um, so, songs or promo? So yeah, for for a while, which is also another thing I want to get back into, which is uh, creating music videos. So I create music videos uh, using mostly like found imagery and stuff that I collage together. So kind of parallel to my music making and my art making, I do video work as well. So for a while, um, I was doing, yes, yeah, some videos. I did a music video for Gafael. I did a few music videos for the Siamese Pearl, which was an early uh, artist that I released on the label. I've done um, two releases with him. And um, just when I find the time, you know, to make these music videos to, yeah, to promote the, the tape or the record, but also just to kind of give a visual accompaniment because I feel that's important with the music. And well, the event that you recently did at um, Mindy Solomon, um, that was for um, Harry Smith and, and Stan Hughes. Um, yeah. Did you, um, like, have you ever done a score before? Um, and can you talk about that a little bit? And sure. So that's that's a big inspiration is experimental film from that era. Um, you know, the Harry Smith, Stom Brockage is a big influence. Uh, Hans Richter, which is something that I saw. And all this stuff is on YouTube, which is a beautiful thing. You could even, you know, you don't have to own the original reel or VHS or whatever. You could watch all this stuff on YouTube and kind of gain inspiration from it. So the live scoring thing, kind of when I first started music, the focus was always kind of that it was a cinematic type of music that might fit alongside a visual, a silent visual. Um, so that kind of got me into doing, yeah, live score. One of the first ones that I did was Nosferatu, which is the you know, silent, silent film th from the 20s. Um, Where did you do that? That was at the Gable Cinema, and that was back in... Oh, a bunch of years ago was that 2015 or 2016 something like that did you do that on your own or with someone uh that was solo um so that's kind of started that uh facet of what i do and then around that time i can't remember everything's just kind of blurring together uh there was something that o cinema was doing called cinema sounds mm -hmm. and um one of the scores that i did was with a local band called axe in the oak and we did a uh, live score to the first 10 minutes of Rumblefish. 
and that kind of um, yeah, that got me just kind of working more with with visual and and playing, you know, improvising live, and that's um, very much an interest of mine recently. And I've been kind of the go-to guy recently for these kinds of things. Hey, we need this silent film scored, you know. Uh, so I've done Kevin of Dr. Caligari. I've done Nosferatu twice. Um, I did this weird slasher film from the seven or from the fifties, fifties or sixties called Blood Feast. That was at Saver Cinema a few months back, actually last year, and um, yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. I feel like music is always kind of scoring life as it goes by, so it's um, you know it just kind of makes sense to score a movie. And have you ever done like a like a solid score where it would live on with that film? Like yeah, so I recently completed. Um, a film score I was working with a local filmmaker named Manny and he's putting out this he finally he, he finally wrapped the whole thing and I did it's a mixture of <clears throat> original music that I made for the film and some actually Night Foundation tracks that he really liked on my SoundCloud and was able to fit into the movie and it's this like kind of coming of age a uh, film about these kids in the 90s in Miami and they're just kind of going through stuff. There's like death and sex and drugs and uh, it's just one of those kinds of uh, flicks and a little bit kind of on the introspective dra dramatic side. Uh, so he felt that my music fit with that and I'm pretty proud of what I came up with. Hasn't been released yet. He's going to do a... Um, release party or a screening at some point right now he's kind of shopping it around to festivals and stuff Pretty cool. mm -hmm. and um have you ever thought of like reaching out to someone and being like i would love to rescore or like you know i don't know uh, um yeah uh for for a while i would have i'm at the point in my life where i'm just busy with a lot of stuff sure, so i've sure. got my day job i've got um you know my creative things that i do as a label so it's a lot um, so sometimes it's like, oh, do I want to put more work on my plate? Um, but, you know, yeah, there is dreams and stuff and there is aspirations, you know, where sometimes I will reach out to say an artist that I really want to release and sometimes it's crickets, sometimes you hear nothing. Um, and that really got me down for a while, you know, where it's just like this non-responsiveness from different things. So I kind of gave up on that for a while and then stuff started kind of coming to me, which I'm content with, you know, uh, for instance, you reaching out and wanting to conduct this interview or, um, you know, Kevin Arrow reaching out and saying, hey, I want you to do this live film score with Gavin at Mindy Solomon. Uh, so things like that, that just kind of happen for a reason, I feel, as opposed to me going out and seeking something that might not be a fit or... I don't know, but I feel like there's potential there maybe sometime in this near future. Really cool. Yeah, you've got a great sort of background for it and a you know, huge body of work to, I think. Yeah, I guess that's what I could kind of stand behind now is just uh, there's, uh, and that's kind of what how I started off the new year was like trying to organize, um, yeah, this body of work that I've amassed over the years, uh, collage work, you know, I feel like... Um, I don't do a piece of work every day, but I'm constantly working on stuff and there are these kind of immediate pieces where there's an idea, I get it out there and then it lives somewhere on a piece of paper, a piece of wood or a piece of canvas and they're all tucked away in a flat file in my house. Uh, so I'm hoping this year I could find a way to like kind of organize everything and maybe sell some of it or maybe give it a new life through an album cover or through a music video or through a projection video piece, something like that. Well, speaking of your, uh, your body of work and, and, you know, selling art and things, you're represented by homework, uh, gallery. Um, any plans for any shows coming up this year or, um, uh, what I like the best about homework is just that they're so sporadic and um, they just like to just keep things fresh. You know, they're always doing something different. They're always looking for a new venue. They're always coming up with a new concept for a show. Um, and they're always looking to do different activations, um, you know, like live performances, film screenings, things like that, which I feel are very integral to the process uh, and the artist, you know, not just being like, okay, this artist does this one thing and let's just focus on selling a painting, you know. Um, so I like that they keep it open to uh, including different things in their programming. 
and uh, which is why I like working with them. So we, you know, we get along well in a business relationship, on a personal relationship as well. And I just feel like they're doing something really interesting and different in the Miami landscape, which is missing, uh, which they're kind of filling that void. Very cool. And um, how long have you been working with them? Uh, since I want to say for the last two or so years, I had a good solo show with them in 2022, and they had this great space at the Noxon Hotel in Biscayne, uh, right by 79th Street. And we got to activate that whole space. We had it for like a week and a little bit more and did something there every night of the exhibit, brought a lot of people in, uh, but it was very much a contained kind of underground DIY thing, which I really enjoyed about it. And um, yeah, I'm hoping to work with them more now in the future. Nothing planned at the moment. Um, right now I was just in a group show with them, which I had a video piece in, and it was um, a Caribbean art-centered um, show, which is an easy sell in Miami, uh, but there's ways to like interpret that, and I felt like every artist in the show did their own kind of interpretation of that, which was very kind of just interesting and not so definitely Miami. I saw your piece. That was kind of in this little cove. Um, in the back, yeah. It was, yeah. A, it was a, 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 a video piece, which is interesting because it's like being at Art Art Week this this year and going through, I was at the NADA Art Fair, there was a lot of painting. And I feel like, um, yeah, that's kind of, that's going to always be the quintessential piece of art is the painting. And I'm just so... I'm so bored of painting, which is why I only I turned to collage. You know, I started in school painting, drawing, but I felt like collage was almost like painting with images. So that's kind of what I've always liked about collage and then filtering that into video work, uh, which has kind of been my, I guess, more current concentration. And you had kind of an altar around it? Was that... Am uh, I thinking... So of... I was kind of just, yeah, just working with the space. You know, like yeah, yeah. you have the space to work with. What can you do with it? So right. I kind of kept that in mind and how we're going to kind of angle the video and have it live in that space for the course of like, yeah, once again, it was like about two weeks yeah. or a week that they were activating. Mm -hmm. Very cool. And yeah, looking around your, your studio here, I see all these, you know, old timey life magazines and, you know... That's all the source, that's... source material, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. So I go thrifting often with my wife and... Um, I'm always looking for books and magazines and stuff to cut up and, uh, you know, one's treasure, one's trash is another's treasure, you know, I feel like, uh, what I like about collage as well is that it's, um, it's very kind of thrifty in that sense where I'm not spending a lot of money on new materials or creating excessive waste, um, in turn taking that waste that's piling up, piling up in these shops and clearing it out and whittling it down and making something new and kind of fresh out of it. Really cool. Yes. Yeah, repurposing, recycling. Yeah, repurpose, recycle, exactly. Uh -huh. And uh, remake, remodel, right? That was a Roxy Music, uh, kick off the first Roxy Music record. <clears throat> and, uh, well, you've also collaborated with other artists. I saw that you recently worked with um, Kelly Breeze on her Dirt's Dives. Like, yeah. What was that... Um, situation there with the bottle was that like a reel to reel that you so she got in touch with me um cause she needed kind of like a sound component to her to her vision of creating this uh this dive bar which that you know that if you're from south florida you know of all the crazy dive bars that are down here and the ones that don't exist anymore that we're sad to see go so it was this kind of like homage to uh this dive bar culture and what does that sound like? Um, so um, the idea was to kind of take some of that gritty, old-timey feeling, so that kind of filtered into that reel-to-reel, -reel, which was just a piece of tape that I cut off of this like easy listening reel that I just strung up. I was like, okay, I'm gonna make um, I'm gonna make a thing specifically for this, but then sometimes chance just happens, and I was like, oh, I like this little melody that plays. I turned it into a loop, and you know, we put it on a reel to reel and strung it around that bottle. And then there was this like old old radio that I've used for years and years. It was like my grandmother's from Cuba, and um, that's just playing static in the bathroom. And then um, I collected a bunch of different field recordings from different dive bars that I went to and I was in Scotland I recorded some stuff at random bars and all of it's just chance kind of operation but it lives 
in her space with her, you know, weird mannequins and old things that she's collected over time that became part of this installation. Wow. So you had that stuff kind of in your archives, some of that. Uh, yeah, well, it was it was some stuff that was, you know, like the tape stuff and then some new stuff that I recorded. And then uh, that became part of this soundscape that if you were to go in there when there wasn't somebody DJing, you would hear this kind right, of soundscape right. that uh, creates the atmosphere for Dirt to Dive. And kind of stringing it through that bottle, did it give it some like a warble or like a different yeah it's always going to be you know it's always going to have a little bit of grittiness and the more that it goes around the tape head it's going to pick up more dust it might snap i think it's been still going you know she hasn't told me it snapped or anything so um but that's that's kind of the beauty of analog technology you know where you're not reliant on something like it's a lot different seeing a laptop playing an mp3 or a reel-to-reel -reel playing a loop from the 1950s you know around a bottle of gin it's just really a different uh, atmosphere really really smart man i love that Went through a lot. yeah no uh, and um well i just love like i said your your studio and and being able to see all the different equipment that you work with and and you know getting into your processes and stuff i really appreciate you know you're taking the time to talk to us about all this stuff yeah and i apologize for the mess uh but i feel like that's part of the kind of working um working process is just kind of uh yeah creating creating something out of a mess which is i guess kind of what we're all doing with our lives right we <laughs> try so. to uh <laughs> we're maybe messy on the inside but we try to give off a facade that we're not as messy or we try to uh aspire for something not so messy <laughs>